Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and do not forget tomorrow it starts our boot camp on forming and maintaining optimal habits. Don't miss it. Um, I probably will, I am going to put it on a video platform but it's always so much more fun to take it live through teleconference so you can ask questions and join the discussion. All right, let's talk about some news. Most people think that more information is always better, particularly where their health is concerned. One of medicine's answers to the more is better theory of, of um, medicine is genetic testing and sequencing, which is the promise of which was to make people more aware of their risk factors, more proactive about their health, and well, the problem it hasn't really lived up to that type of promise. So. In order to look at the impact of genetic testing, researchers randomized 100 patients recruited by their doctors to one of two groups. One group had their entire genome sequenced in order, in addition to getting a family history report, and the other one just got a family history report. The purpose was to see how genomic medicine would look for healthy people in just a regular doctor's office setting. And of course, the definition of healthy people is always a little bit subjective, but we'll just go with it for now. The sequencing method was quite rigorous. It started with vetting each patient's data from a list of 5,000 disease-associated genes and 5 million genetic variants. And they gradually narrowed it down through a whole process that's kind of complicated and doesn't travel very well or doesn't transfer very well in this kind of a setting. But um, the bottom line is that at the end of the day, they were pretty specific in what they were able to identify. The group was surprised to find that variants were predictive of rare diseases um, in uh, were detected in 11 out of 50 patients who had their genome sequenced. Nine of the 11 had no signs of these diseases. The patients were in the 50 to 60 year old age range, which is when the types of diseases that to which people are genetically predisposed generally have shown up by that point in time. Um, the two out of the group who had already experienced some signs of disease, one had a problem with night vision and the other had a skin problem that resulted in uh, sun sensitivity. They didn't learn anything, they just had a genetic explanation for what they already knew was going on. The researchers say that this whole thing illustrates how little is understood about penetrance, whether or not a genetic variant will actually cause disease in an individual, because again, by this point in time, that age range, one would have expected um, that the people who had this genetic predisposition, they would all be sick. According to researcher Jason Bassey, he says it's misleading to equate advances in big data and genomic tools with similar strides in understanding how genetic variants impact health. Um, this is a continuing theme in genetic testing. You a lot of noise, not much real information that benefits anybody. The patients didn't appear to have any signs of psychological distress as a result of the information they received, but they did spend an extra $350 for the test. So if you if this, a test like this were to become common in a country with 320 or 30 million people and generate billions of dollars for the test companies, great benefit for them, actually not so great for the people who are paying the money. Um, the researchers couldn't identify any direct risks or benefits, but did say that one of the concerns that they had was that at some point in time life insurance companies might um, uh, start using criteria like this to turn down claims, that's not so, or to turn down uh, insurance coverage, which would not be so good. Uh, the study is consistent with others that have shown that most people with genetic risks don't actually develop the diseases for which they are predisposed, um, so the tests just don't provide much usable information. Like I said before, a lot of noise, not much, uh, not much real benefit. I think the time and money invested in this kind of thing would be much better spent if we just showed people, let's get a diet history, an exercise history, let's look at your diet and lifestyle habits and give you some counseling about how to improve those things so you reduce your risk of disease regardless of your genetic predisposition. Um, as for me, I'm not going to have these tests. I'm always all about more information except when it comes to my own body. I don't want any more information. I'll tell you why. I think I'm healthy. One of the reasons I think I'm healthy, I am healthy, is because I think I'm healthy and I don't want to mess that up. And I'm sure in a 60-year-old body, if you poke and prod long enough, you'll find something worth paying attention to. I don't want to know what it is. All right, moving on to another topic. Degenerative knee disease is a common condition that causes pain for about 25% of people over age 45. The most common orthopedic surgery in the United States is arthroscopic surgery um, for the knee, which is promoted by a lot of orthopedic surgeons is the best way to just address the problem and restore function. Now, based on the belief that the procedure is effective, we spend about $3 billion a year on these surgeries here in the United States. Evidence, however, shows that surgery is not the best approach and actually may worsen instead of improve function. 
Research group looked at 13 randomized controlled trials and 12 observational studies to determine both the benefits and risks of arthroscopic surgery as compared to less invasive methods of dealing with knee pain. The study concluded that patients with degenerative knee disease receive very little benefit in terms of reduction in pain, increase in function, or improvement in quality of life. While there was some benefit in the short term, like reduction in pain, in the long term the researchers report that the benefits of the surgery for quality of life are, quote, minimal if they exist at all, end of quote. As with all procedures, there are risks, in this case infection is one of them. Additionally, some studies indicate that the procedure may actually increase the um, likelihood that you would require a knee replacement later on. The researchers state that while their review did not find the surgery to benefit the general population with knee pain, there might be some subpopulation of patients who would benefit, but they said, quote, the burden of proof now rests with those who claim such a subpopulation exists with compelling to come up with such evidence, essentially, in the form of randomized controlled trials. They also state that patients and their doctors must discuss and weigh the, quote, marginal short-term benefits against the burden of the surgical procedure, which include pain, swelling, limited mobility, and restriction of activities over a period of two to six weeks. This is not new information, but it's the most comprehensive review that's ever been done of this type of uh, research, and it included, this particular review included 10 studies that were not included in the original, in the last most recent review that looked at this thing, this type of information. Another common procedure for de resolving degenerative knee conditions is steroid injections, but the results are no better. According to a recent study published in JAMA, corticosteroid injections every three months over a two-year period resulted in no reduction in knee pain and significantly greater loss of cartilage as compared to patients who got a placebo injection. Once again, better to do nothing at all than to do this. The researchers concluded that steroid injections were not an effective treatment for people with knee osteoarthritis. So, since this stuff doesn't work, what should you do if you have knee pain? Well, the first thing is lose weight. Increased weight places increased pressure on the knees and leads to more pain. Dietary change lowers pain levels. A diet, plant-based foods, low in fat, high in fiber, lowers inflammation levels, and it also results in faster weight loss, which lowers inflammation levels and takes pressure off the knees. Taking yoga classes can be helpful. Many times the reason people have knee pain is actually not due to arthritis, but rather to the tracking of the knee due to muscle asymmetry. Yoga is an enjoyable and very inexpensive way to begin to strengthen and stretch out muscles and restore that type of symmetry that restores the function of the joint. Uh, the right type of manual physical therapy can be helpful if you get a really good physical therapist who knows how to fix people and teach them how to do exercises at home that repair that works as well. And I might note, all of these strategies I've just talked about, less expensive, no negative side effects, nothing can go wrong, you don't get infections from physical therapy, yoga, and dietary change and weight loss, you don't get pain and swelling, and uh, you don't end up having a knee replacement as a result of these things either. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next Tuesday with more news.